I'd like to ask one question about the overall economy of Spain, one about the banking system, and one about Santander. Um, one of your most important charts, I thought, showed the comparative evolution of unit labor costs in the major European countries, including Spain. And if I interpret the, the slide correctly, you showed that Spain has already achieved an internal devaluation of about 10% mm. over the last three years. That's right. So one question is, how did you do that? The next question is, how much more is necessary? Because there's still a gap of about 10% between Spain and the Euro average against Germany, which I guess people have to try to approximate to eliminate the internal imbalances within the union. Uh, so really two questions. How has the internal devaluation so far been achieved? How much more is needed? And how do you get that? Well, uh, a, a very uh, fair question. Um, in, in, in fact, when you look at the rates of unemployment in Spain and how they uh, went uh, sharply up throughout the crisis, the positive element of this very negative one is that we are uh, regaining competitiveness by definition. So, I mean, it, it has cost us a lot in terms of uh, social unrest and, and questions related to labor market. But the positive element of the capacity of restructuring of the Spanish uh, 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 private sector has been extremely, extremely positive throughout these cases. Also, there's been a, a, a moderation in the labor costs uh, uh, because of, uh, of uh, this active uh, uh, way that we are uh, managing uh, the dialogue between entrepreneurs and, and trade unions, and also because the fact that the economy is in a very weak uh, uh, state means that the, the demands for increases in, in wages are not that uh, evident in this moment of the market. Well, uh, the fact that uh, any time that you make uh, this kind of internal devaluation, it costs you a lot of, uh, in terms of uh, increase in unemployment, means that with the, this new regulation in terms of labor, in future cycles, you are not going to witness this sharp increase of unemployment the minute you start to adjust uh, the economy. So we uh, still uh, have to move in the direction of, uh, of uh, 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 reducing these imbalances with Europe. Uh, we are in a good trend, and my expectation is through a combination of an increase uh, uh, wages in, in the Central European countries, mostly in Germany, and through a moderation in Spain, we are going to achieve this goal of regaining competitiveness. Because, I mean, the resilience of the sporting sector in Spain is, is, is remarkable. Uh, Spain has not lost uh, 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 market share uh, throughout the crisis in exports. Uh, and uh, in one of the charts, it showed how we, we increase our export uh, uh, much faster than the average, uh, much faster than the average of the Eurozone. So the fact- Or, or even faster than Germany. Yes, yes, that's correct. That means that the, the, the Spanish competitiveness, by definition, uh, we, we demonstrate through the increases of exports that is, is in the... Well, this is maybe, in my view, uh, 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 coupled with the fact of the diversification of the large corporates in Spain. I mean, if you look to the 35 largest uh, cor corporates in Spain that are quoted in the, in the index, you see that the earnings uh, of these uh, 35 largest corporates are uh, close to 50% outside Spain as an average. That means that in Spain today, we have a, a strength provided by the fact that the large corporates like Santander or Telefonica or the electric utilities are well diversified, or the construction companies are well diversified, that provides a lot of support for the economy as a whole and for the exporting sector. Let me turn to the banking system that you addressed. Your remarks were very comprehensive, but there was one thing you did not mention that I want to ask you about. There's been a lot of concern about a kind of rolling bank run in Spain, mm. withdrawal of deposits mm. from Spanish banks in the aggregate. Mm. Is that accurate? How serious is it? Is it continuing? Has it affected Santander? Well, I mean, if you look to our, uh, our own figures, and Santander is starting with your large question, in fact, we have aggressively increased our deposits in Spain over the last uh, 12 uh, months. So, I mean, uh, for us, uh, uh, this has been a flight to quality. It's been very positive, the, 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 the movement of all the deposits. But if you look at the, at the economy as a whole, 
One of the remarkable aspects, uh, and I'm talking for Spain, but also for Portugal, I'm uh, the chairman of our bank in Portugal, so I follow very closely what is happening in Portugal. There is a remarkable stickness of the, of the deposit, uh, retail deposits in, uh, in, in those countries, both in Spain and in Portugal. The reason for that is, first of all, you have uh, uh, protected or warranted up to 100,000 uh, euros of deposit, and the second, that there is not being uh, any kind of definite movement in this direction. The uh, Bank of Spain, uh, uh, I think it was three weeks ago, tried to reconcile the figures that are public and the ones that have been quoted and mentioned publicly, reconciling it with the real impact on deposits. And the figure that we are talking about in terms of balance of payments in the case of Spain is uh, in the region of 15 billion uh, euros, which is something uh, uh, insignificant is through a period of one year. So my uh, answer is definitely there is not a movement outside the Spain in deposits. Uh, there are, the, the sport deposits are very sticky. And also the figures have been magnified by the fact that there was a transformation of traditional deposits into uh, a kind of uh, a commercial paper in which, I mean, when you look at the figures, it appears that the the deposits are, are, are going down, but they've been transformed in another instrument very similar to deposits, but that, that doesn't fall under the category of deposits. So you, you have to look very attentively through the figures to realize that there is no such thing as movements uh, from deposits uh, away from Spain. Okay, and then thirdly, a question about Santander. Uh, you stress that one of the secrets of your success was diversification, particularly into emerging markets. Your chart that showed the details of Santander's diversification, indicated that, as you said, 50% of your assets, your profits, I guess, were in emerging markets. The chart showed virtually all of that was Latin America. Yeah. Question, you apparently have not moved very much into Asia. Is that a deliberate strategy, or will that change in the future? And if so, why? The obvious language and cultural uh, uh, relationship, and maybe that's the answer, but was it a conscious decision not to enter emerging markets beyond Latin America, uh, and will that hold in the future? Well, uh, uh, we are very disciplined in our strategy. I mean, uh, for retail banking, it's very important, uh, first of all, to have a, 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 a competitive advantage, to know what your core competencies are, and to have critical mass in, in, in individual markets. According to my 30 years experience in retail banking, these are very fundamental uh, questions. If you, are, you have no critical mass in one country, you cannot afford to have all your proper systems, your proper management capacities addressing a market that is very, very, very small, and you lose competitive advantage with, with the local uh, competitors. So, I mean, in Asia, we don't have these elements. First of all, uh, we have no competitive advantage. We can enjoy this competitive advantage in Latin America, but certainly not in Asia. Second, it's very difficult to, to, to have a critical mass, in the, uh, by definition, in the Asian markets, because they are very large markets, and, uh, uh, and it's very difficult for regulatory elements, implications, to have proper control of, the, of those banks. So we don't feel that for us uh, it would be uh, uh, the logical uh, uh, um, movement, a strategic movement, to establish ourselves with a bank like the one we have in Brazil, let's say in India, or in Indonesia, or in China. What we are trying to do in Asia, because, uh, I mean, uh, we, we, uh, it's obvious that this is a region that is fast growing, that is going, is bound to have very imp important uh, implications in the future, is to profit for the, from the flow of funds between uh, Europe and Asia, and Asia and Latin America. This will provide us with unique opportunities to profit for trade finance transactions or for investment, direct investment transactions, when you uh, have the customer on which side, you can provide them for opportunities, rather than going to a traditional uh, 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 presence with a domestic bank in those countries. Thank you much. Okay, the floor is open for question. Uh, we've got a traveling mic, we've got a standing mic in the back. Use either, identify yourself, and fire away. Anders.
Thank you very much for an interesting presentation. I wanted to follow up on Fred's last point here about your regional strategy, because it appears to me that Bank Santander is not the bank that both buys and sells most banks, uh, big banks. And you have, if I got the details right, you have just uh, sold out in Moscow, uh, and uh, you have just made a big IPO in Mexico of your uh, subsidiary there while you have bought two banks in Poland. Could you elaborate on this? Is yes. Bank Santander moving further towards Eastern Europe, but concentrating to Europe rather than going out uh, in line with uh, your question, uh, your answer on Asia? Thank you. Yeah, uh, uh, in the case of Poland, uh, uh, we had the opportunity to buy into existing operation that provide us with all the elements that uh, are for us uh, fundamental in our strategy to have uh, 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 um, uh, the, the competitive advantage because we had already in Poland a consumer finance operation, so we knew the market. And close to Poland, we have in Germany an operation, so we can acce have access to talent, to teams, to, to uh, uh, all the kinds of uh, uh, structures that are necessary in order to have this competitive advantage. Then we have the bank with a critical mass, certainly, in the, in the Polish market, so they also met our standards, <laughs> and also, obviously, in terms of diversification, because we move into another um, market. In the case of, of Russia, we divested precisely because we, don't, we didn't have critical mass, competitive advantage in the market, so we decided to go out in there. Uh, in the case of the IPO in Mexico, it follows our, our, our idea to have uh, our subsidiaries quoted in the markets, because this provides us with uh, the following uh, uh, advantages. First of all, you have market pressure on your management, because the management has to deliver, not just vis-a-vis -vis the headquarters, but also in terms of the, of, the, of the markets. So they have to present their quarterly results, to answer to questions of analysts and investors and so, so forth, we, th we think and with them that this pressure, market pressure, is extremely positive. The fact that we, we, we need to have in our, gov in our governance in those uh, uh, cases independence is also very positive because it gives us a, a balance in terms of corporate governance that we think is very appropriate. And in terms of capital raising, it gives us an, an enormous opportunity to raise capital where in the areas where we think is more favorable. Imagine that Santander would need for whatever reason, to raise capital now in Spain in the middle of this uh, economic crisis. I mean, the kind of dilution for our shareholders would be very, very significant. Whereas if you sell 25% uh, of uh, uh, Mexico or the appetite uh, of investors is very considerable to the extent that when this IPO was largely oversubscribed, gives us access to capital eh, without uh, diluting your shareholders as much as we were to do it in the markets with the very adverse uh, uh, circumstances by the fact, well, the case of, of, of Mexico, we were able to boost our, our core capital by 49 basis points as a result of the IPO. So you, you, you see a very efficient way to access capital uh, for the bank in a moment where to have a very strong capital base is fundamental for our business. Bob Samuelson. Yeah, uh, Bob Samuelson, I write a column for the Washington Post. In your talk, you did not mention the ECB. And I'm just wondering, in retrospect, when you look uh, back on the crisis, are there th does the ECB bear any responsibility for the crisis? Were there things that it did that it shouldn't have done, and things that it didn't do that it should have done? Well, in the case of the ECB, uh, uh, I, I would have a, a general comment about uh, the instruments of macroeconomic policy in any given market. Uh, when you are uh, having a restrictive fiscal policy, the logical uh, compensation for that is to have a flexible uh, monetary uh, policy. And uh, by, uh, the, uh, by the way, is what is happening in the US, what is happening in the UK. So I would uh, uh, welcome uh, a flexible uh, monetary policy in Europe to be coupled with a restrictive fiscal policy. What is the European Central Bank addressing? How is the European Central uh, Bank addressing this issue? I think Draghi is doing a great job in this respect. First of all, because he had operated the European Central Bank as a lender of last resort for banks, I mean, injecting one trillion euros into the system. The, that means that the, the proper role of a central bank as a lender of last resort for banks is being, I mean, in there. And then the, the role of the European Central Bank as a lender of last resort of sovereign 
he has addressed the issue through a, through a framework that has been announced uh, 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 prior to the, to, the, to the summer and afterwards more, in more detailed fashion in September, when he defined a framework in which uh, the, uh, the European Central Bank would be willing to buy whatever amount of uh, sovereign debt would be required in the secondary market according to its statute, the European Central Bank is able to buy into secondary market, provided, uh, which is, I think, uh, uh, the, the efficient way to do it, that there were some uh, operations also in the primary market. As this operation uh, cannot be done by the Central Bank itself, but on behalf of the European uh, uh, funds, once you have in place the European funds, you have the double capacity to operate in the primary market and the secondary market. There is a condition for that, and this is understandable too, because I mean, uh, once you set in place a, 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 a policy of intervening in the market, you have to be sure that the countries uh, uh, go on with their uh, fiscal, uh, addressing the, the fiscal issue. So the conditionality element to it, that's one of the clauses of this intervention of the European Central Bank is obviously in there. So the countries have to ask for the intervention and the European uh, uh, Union has to uh, uh, I mean, uh, as accept this and, and, and set a system of conditionality. Uh, and this is a, 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 a very clear framework to the extent that operationally is, uh, is uh, providing some boost for sovereign debt to the extent that prior to the statement of Draghi, the Spanish uh, spread on uh, the year 10-year uh, bond was uh, as high as 650 basis points, today is 425. That means it has had an impact. Is this impact sufficient enough? Well, I mean, uh, in my view, uh, the logical spread for the Spanish debt, given the macro uh, macroeconomic fundamentals, would be in the region of 200 basis points rather than 400, in excess of 400. So there is some leeway in order to, uh, to go into the direction of a more normalized kind of uh, uh, sovereign debt position. Uh, uh, provided that the government in Spain uh, 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 at the end of this year uh, gets to the objective of 6.3% uh, public sector deficit will be a, a right step and a very important step in the right uh, uh, di direction. Let me just extend that uh, analysis a bit if I could, uh, drawing on your ex deep experience in government as well as in Santander. Um, what do you expect by way of timing now in terms of the Prime Minister's request for this program to go into effect, therefore the lending from the ECB and maybe the ESM to take place? How do you see the next steps unfolding in well, Spain's role in the overall financing picture? First of all, uh, there is not so much market pressure as, uh, as uh, we had uh, a, a number of weeks ago, in the sense that the um, uh, markets for, for Spanish sovereign debt are pretty stable in the last uh, few weeks. That means there are not uh, a, a strong uh, market pressure in order to, to, to jump ahead. Uh, the possibility of the government to go funding itself in the shorter uh, end of the yield curve at reasonable cost is in there, so there is no pressure on the market, there is no pressure in terms of adding to the cost of, of, the, of, the, of the debt. That means that we are in a position in which the, the, the government has the privilege uh, to wait to see what the kind of conditionality is attached to the, to the package, first of all, and second, what could be the likely reactions in Europe once you have to set the, the parliaments in Europe discussing this issue. Is public, I think, uh, as uh, I think yesterday, uh, the, the Minister of Finance of Germany has stated that, that in his view, uh, the Spanish government does not uh, need to go uh, and to require this kind of uh, intervention by the European Central Bank, and the, he believes that the Spanish government is able to provide support to the markets by complying with the objectives of deficit. So you have a position in which there is not that pressure. Second, a position in which the government in Spain expects uh, the conditionality to be clarified. And third, this is a position, a very prominent member of the European Union, stating that Spain doesn't require to go to, the, to this uh, assistance. So, I mean, this is the scenario. Do you share that view yourself? Personally, I think that provided that the, that the, that the markets allow for time 
to Spain to address the issue of public sector deficit, for, uh, most probably the best outcome is not to, to ask for, for, for this. If, and this is very important, if the conditions of fiscal uh, 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 set, uh, uh, how to reduce the public sector deficit at, are, are met, these conditions, and uh, the government is able to comply with that, and this will uh, clarify the situation with the markets. Uh, this is a very important uh, question, and provided that uh, Europe is able to answer in a very concrete uh, and specific fashion to any demand that would be uh, uh, asked from Spain in terms of conditionality. What kind of condition conditionality is in there? Is sufficient to meet uh, the objectives for public sector de deficit? You need uh, additional reforms. Uh, well, there are questions that have been discussed, and you see noises from different uh, uh, constituencies in Europe, uh, meaning different aspects. So the thing is not totally clarified, and think when things are not totally clarified, the best uh, position is to wait and see. Next question. Uh, Tom Enns back, Russ Um This is on a somewhat uh, different note, but I think it's relevant. Uh, the Catalans are once again uh, raising their heads, asking for even more autonomy. Uh, to what extent uh, will that be successful, and to what extent will that influence Spain's relationship with the ECB and um, uh, the other parts of the EU? Catalonia. Catalonia, yeah. Catalonia, yeah, Catalonia issue. Well, I mean, uh, uh, this is uh, a, a situation in which, uh, at the end of the day, uh, uh, the government has to comply, obviously, with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, the constitutional uh, requirements, and there is very leeway in which uh, the government has to move. There is more leeway in terms of the financial uh, implications of all that. If uh, there is a need to equilibrate the contribution of Catalonia to the rest of Spain, it's a matter uh, that could be discussed, has been discussed over the years, and there's been uh, some, uh, some adjustment in this. So, I mean, uh, I hope that the, the, the outcome of this process, once the uh, elections in Catalonia are over, are linked more to the financial uh, structures than to any other constitutional issues. But how will that complicate Spain's relationship with the rest of Europe, and uh, well, particularly economic support from the rest of Europe? No, I don't think that uh, in this point in time there are any chances uh, of the status quo being challenged. So I don't see any reason for this relationship to, to be changed uh, 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 in, under the present circumstances. I, 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 I don't see any reasons to, for, for a, a Europe to be concerned about a, a thing that, uh, I mean, it has not a realistic uh, outcome. Question up here. Hi, I'm Nancy Donaldson with the ILO. Um, I'm curious about what you would say about the youth unemployment situation in Spain, and what is the role of the private sector in helping to tackle these issues, and especially uh, companies like yours and others that are in a better position than some? Well, starting with the last part of your question, the, the Santander started a program uh, 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 of a number of uh, uh, persons that uh, could work in the bank and also contributing for the, uh, uh, young people to be employed in, in companies with the assistance of, of Santander. So we are doing uh, a, a part of this effort in order to address this, uh, this issue, which is uh, a, very, a very negative issue because, uh, I mean, we are talking of uh, youth unemployment in Spain close to 50%, doubling the average uh, 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 of Europe. Uh, uh, the, 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 the answer to, uh, to that is, is linked, once again, to the labor reform and once uh, the economy uh, starts picking up in growth. Now we are in the process of deleveraging, and the companies uh, need to deleverage, the companies need to regain competitiveness, so we are in a, in a process of adjustment. Once this process of adjustment is over, I think that the new conditions in the labor market in Spain are much more flexible, so the companies are going to be more liable to employ more people, because the conditions attaching, attached to hiring people are so not penalizing as much as in the past the companies for doing this. So it was a great reluctance by companies of hiring people because if you get it wrong and at the end of the day you, you, you need to, to lay off these people, the costs were prohibited. So I mean, at the end of the day was 
a, 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 a problem of rigid, the rigidity of the labor market. I think one important issue of Spain throughout the years was the rigidity of the labor market. Every time the Spanish economy entered into a negative period, you had the unemployment rate going through the roof. I mean, that means uh, that you need to address the issue of the labor reform. This issue has been addressed. The short-term impact of the measures are not in there because it requires, first of all, that the economy starts growing again. And once the, the economy starts growing again, you will see a, a labor market in Spain more normalized. So hiring more people uh, and, and having a, a kind of more uh, a flexible situation than you used to have in the past. So, I mean, this issue, the structural issue and, uh, is being addressed by the government and in a very positive fashion in my, in my, in my view. Danny Xufengjiang with Xinhua News Agency from China. Thanks for doing this. The latest ECB action has bought some time for Eurozone reforms. But how long should we wait to see the huge liquidity translating into a pickup of lending to small and medium sized businesses and a real growth? What would be the growth? drivers in coming years with so much austerity still going on. Thank you. Well, it's true that the, if you look at the, at the numbers, that the injection, this one trillion uh, uh, euros injection up uh, to very recently was redeposited in the, in, the, in, the, in the Europe Central Bank. So that the, the injection of liquidity to the system as a whole was not uh, that important. Well, uh, the European Central Bank has addressed this issue by uh, paying nothing to their uh, deposits when you uh, deposit back in the European Central Bank. It was a move in trying to, to get this liquidity uh, back to the market instead of being redeposited in the, in the European Central Bank, which is a, a, a good move. But at the end of the day, uh, the liquidity has to be used provided that the companies have gone through the cycle of uh, deleveraging. And there are some countries in which the companies can still do deleverage. So, I mean, it could be, I mean, uh, something very awkward to ask the companies to deleverage and to borrow at the same time. So, I mean, uh, uh, there is one question that had to be addressed once this process of deleverage would be over, in, in, and in which in instances the, the credit to the economy would be a fundamental uh, a, a question in Europe uh, as a whole. But uh, there is another interesting issue uh, in, between in, in Europe. So I, we need that the, uh, the, the, uh, the German economy to grow faster. So the issue of Europe is that according to the latest uh, uh, report of the IMF, the economy in Germany is going to grow 0.9%. Imagine if you in the US, you are concerned with the US economy growing 2.1% uh, uh, next year, and we are talking of Germany 0.9%. That means that in Europe, we need that the, the, the engine uh, of the European economy, uh, the German economy, to grow faster, to help the rest of the economy. So, I mean, these issues related to loans, re related to, to growth of the economy, should be addressed more to the countries where the process of deleveraging is not an issue, rather than to the countries where we still do have the, the, this deleverage, and we need to be helped in this deleverage by the stronger economies in Europe. Um, you mentioned in your remarks a couple of times banking union uh, in Europe, and you stressed its importance, but you also stressed that it will take some time to get it underway. Uh, could you elaborate on that? Which parts of the banking union do you think are most important? Is it moving to mutualized deposit insurance? Is it the supervisory network? But which, which elements of banking union are most important? And talk a little more, because we, we did talk about it privately over lunch, uh, your view, I think, that the European-wide banking union should supervise the systemically important banks, not all the banks, simply because the latter is such a practical difficulty. Well, uh, certainly, I mean, uh, when you go into a banking union, you have to address the issue of uh, supervision, you have to address the issue of how to warranty the deposits, and you have to issue uh, the issue of resolution of banks that uh, were under, under stress or difficulties. You have to, to do the three things because uh, we cannot go to a, a supervision if there are not the proper tools of resolution. And then uh, if you have, to, uh, uh, in the terms of resolution, you need how to deal with the deposits where they are warranted or not, who is going to pay for that. So these three levels are very important to do them 
uh, uh, in order to have a proper banking union. In terms of the timetable, there are practical implications. I mean, if you ask uh, uh, one supervisor uh, to handle 6,000 banks uh, uh, immediately, I mean, this is obviously a very tough uh, task, even if you uh, are helped in this task by the local supervisor uh, one time, because we have issues of level playing field, issues for comparability, there are a number of technical issues in, in, in there. So, I mean, with countries like uh, Germany that are objecting uh, this movement or, or, or how fast they have to go in there, they are saying, are, are considering these elements or this implication of complexity. So, uh, in, theoretically, it would be much more practical to go step by step, being the first step the larger banks in Europe, in which, I mean, there are relatively few, and so the movement towards this supervision would be easier to handle than moving towards 6,000 banks uh, suddenly. But the implication, and this is the point uh, being taken by the European Commission, is that we are missing something if we do this, because at the end of the day, what created the crisis in, Euro in Europe were not the large banks. There were Northern Rock, was a minor, minor bank, there were the saving banks in Spain that were, by definition, smaller banks. So if you go ahead and you do the supervision just uh, for large banks, you may end up missing something. So there are uh, arguments for both parts. One, technical complexity, uh, uh, and so, uh, but there is another argument, very powerful too, that if you concentrate just on the, on the large systemic banks, you are missing something in terms of what can create problems in the future in the system as it ha has happened uh, in the past with the smaller banks. Okay, uh, Randy. Uh, thank you. I'm uh, Randy Henning here at the Peterson Institute and at American University. Fred, an Fred anticip anticipated my question when he asked about banking union. Uh, I wanted to ask if you could elaborate a little bit more on the structure that you would like to see for, uh, for supervision uh, under the arrangements that are now being discussed, of course, supervision for Santander would migrate from uh, the Bank of Spain to the European Central Bank uh, in the first instance. Uh, could you talk a little bit about how you feel about that? Uh, and secondly, what you think should be the, the division of labor uh, between the ECB on the one hand, and the national bank regulatory authorities on the other, and uh, the European banking authority. Well, in the, in the, um, the question of the position of Santander is very clearly, we're in favor of this movement, because I think uh, to have in Europe a level playing field is still important, uh, to make uh, when you are uh, into risk-weighted assets, internal models, to have comparable internal models, comparable hypotheses in terms of uh, expected losses, etc., it's extremely important to create a level playing field in Europe. So are, we are totally in favor of going in this uh, direction. Not just for the, the matters related to the safety of the system, but also for, for matters related to the, uh, the proper rules of, 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 of competition within the, within the market. So we're definitely in favor of this movement. How can we technically deal with that? Well, I mean, there are uh, uh, typically the issues uh, uh, bottom-up, uh, the smaller loans, the analysis, uh, etc., that can be uh, gone being handled by the inspectors of uh, national supervisors. Supervisors, but the levels of, of when you are dealing with elements related to systemic risk, comparability of systems, comparability of stress testing throughout the Eurozone, I think that the, the role of the European Central Bank it, it, it can be extremely important. You cannot have the European Central Bank de dealing with minor issues as of the proper qualification of a credit, a substandard, of non-performing, etc. But there is certainly a role to be played in terms of having the proper uh, regulatory uh, uh, rules across the, 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 the banks in Europe and the systemic implications of any bank failure on how this could uh, affect the, the globality of the financial sector in, in, in Europe. Ernie? Uh, Ernie Prieg, Manufacturers Alliance. Uh, two or three times today you mentioned the big question, the big if, 
uh, related to the, uh, the fiscal deficit. It can be put 6.3 or not 6.3, that is the question. And my question is, well, but what happens if it turns out to be 7.3 or somewhat higher? Uh, what happens then, not only in governments, but in markets? Well, I guess that uh, 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 this would be a disappointment, obviously, in terms of, uh, of the markets and also in terms of the government, because the government has been stated very clearly that they are planning to meet the objective of 6.3. So it's more a matter of credibility than a matter of proper impact on, on the sustainability of the Spanish debt, because I mean, what we are talking about is uh, not uh, huge differences. It's a matter of, of credibility, which for the market is very important. Once you set an objective, uh, you have to meet this objective, otherwise uh, the markets are not going to believe you next time to you say that maybe not, not this year, but the year after, so on and so forth. So the implications for me are a matter of credibility, nor are not certainly a matter of this being a fundamental uh, question or the fundamental is implications of sustainability of debt if you overcome the goal by X uh, uh, fraction of percentage uh, 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 point. I think it would be very important if you want to overcome uh, the, the, uh, the image of a country that does not comply with the objectives of public sector to meet certainly this objective, and there are tools in which uh, can allow you to achieve it. Uh, further uh, cuts in, uh, in expenses, obviously, would be the, 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 the most uh, adequate way to deal with the equation, but also to increase maybe indirect taxation some, somewhat in order to, to meet the objectives. But, uh, this is a very important matter, certainly. Weird. Uh, Reardon Rowett, Johns Hopkins, size. Uh, Brazil is a very important part of your portfolio. Uh, the president at the United Nations and the finance minister talk constantly about currency wars. Inflationary pressures are growing, growth is low, and we talk about deindustrialization when you're in Sao Paulo. Would you comment on the bank's view of where Brazil is going and are they, are they going in the right direction? Well, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Brazil, as you know uh, uh, very well, uh, have to, uh, a couple of uh, uh, difficult uh, quotas in terms of growth, and the government uh, jump in in order to address the issue of growth of the, of the, of the economy. By now, uh, I think that the, the markets are convinced, and the latest projections of AMF go in the same direction, that the economy is going to grow in the region of four percentage points uh, the GDP next year, which be, uh, can be a decent uh, rate of growth for the Brazilian economy. So I think that uh, uh, with this, you will uh, have back, uh, back uh, uh, Brazil to the growth path and a, a sustainable growth path, because we are talking four percent. I mean, we are not talking uh, about the uh, uh, non-sustainability of a very higher uh, uh, rate of, uh, of growth. In the case of Brazil, I think they are addressing the, 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 the implications of huge needs for infrastructure investment. And this, I think, that the, that the markets are able, because the visibility of Brazil with the market is very positive, as you know perfectly well. And so I think that markets will be willing to, 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 to invest in, in Brazil, so helping the country to address the issue of some the, of the infrastru infrastructural uh, implications of their growth in the, into, into the future. As to the financial sector, in the case of Brazil, there is a slight pickup in non-performing loans as a result of this uh, decline of the growth of the economy, but we are all in the banking sector uh, confident that this uh, is going to be a, a transitional uh, pickup of uh, non-performing lo uh, uh, loans without further uh, uh, implications for that. So we are not reasons to, at all to be concerned about the growth of the Brazilian economy or the implication of such growth for the financial sector of the country as a whole. That by definition is very strong. We have uh, very strong competitors in, in Brazil, very high quality banks. The, the banking sector is extremely strong and this is also uh, a source of uh, potential growth for the Brazilian economy, the fact that they, they have a very sound, uh, a very competitive financial sector. Will Santander be playing an important role in the World Cup and the next Olympics <laughs> <laughs> through Brazil. This is a this is a matter for pride of, of Spain in these difficult times that at least in the <laughs> sporting field we are doing quite well. <laughs> Let's keep it that way. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, 
Thank you. Luis Fierro, Inter-American Development Bank. Uh, first, uh, I'd like to thank you for your presentation, which was quite reassuring in contrast with some of the headlines that were mentioned before. Uh, second, I was curious if you could further elaborate a bit on the independence of the capital of the, of the subsidiaries. Uh, you mentioned that there's a firewall, but I imagine still the, the, the Spanish bank, the, the main bank, has a controlling share of the different subsidiaries. and, and so, for example, if you purchase shares of, of Banco Santander in Spain, you are buying a stake in these other subsidiaries. Uh, just if you can further clarify that. Thank yes, you. Yes, sure. I mean, our aim is to have uh, our subsidiaries uh, being able to be to support themselves in terms of capital, in terms of uh, liquidity, and all their capacity of uh, funding in the, in the system without uh, uh, having to uh, recourse uh, to the parent company. So, I mean, this creates a number of firewalls because at the end of the day, if you were to have a problem uh, of systemic implications in one of the countries where we operate, at the end of the day, the impact on, the, uh, on Santander would be limited to the investment that you have in capital in these subsidiaries without further implications in turn to additional support being provided by the parent company. So this system, we think, is extremely fair because at the end of the day, we are competing exactly the same like the local uh, banks, competitors, uh, with the same rules in terms of uh, compliance with the, with the local uh, requirements in terms of capital, with additional, I mean, uh, uh, competitive advantages by the fact that we can leverage our investment in technology or in human resources or in product capacity through the different uh, uh, brands uh, or different uh, uh, countries in which we operate. So we are adding from the, from the parent company in terms to, of uh, capacity, in, in terms of operational uh, systems, etc. But in terms of capital liquidity and financial implications to the parent company, we want to keep them totally uh, uh, independent, not to be reliant. Because, I mean, in, in, in a bank as large as Santander, the minute that you, you show to your supervisor, to the market, that a major problem were to happen in one of the countries where we operate, if we are able to demonstrate that this problem stops with our writing off the capital investment in, the, in this subsidiary, we are in a very uh, safe ground. Otherwise, I mean, if this has some other uh, implications that are not clarified to the market, I mean, you enter into a, a number of issues of the, systemati the, the systematic implication of a local crisis for Santander. So we want to protect this with firewalls around each of the individual banks in which we uh, participate and we operate. Okay, are there any further questions? If not, Mr. Rodriguez and Siate, thank you very much for a very comprehensive very clear presentation. We hope your optimism is right. I personally share it. Not everybody here does, but we will see. We thank you for coming. We'll look forward to staying in touch and to hear further as all this evolves. Well, thank you very much. I mean, it, it, for me, it's been certainly a pleasure and an honor to be addressing such a distinguished uh, group and such lively dialogue that for me was uh, very stimulating, uh, certainly. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you.